have with us today, uh, Grant, who's been on a, a wonderful tour. And I'm not going to give much of an introduction other than here's the book. Um, and I'm going to actually ask Bo Adams to come up and do a little bit more of an introduction. Thank you again for being here. Thanks, Damian. So I got to know Grant first through his book, The Falconer, what we wish we had learned in school. And it has been one of the most foundational elements of my emerging educational philosophy and thinking about educational change. And one of the five most influential books I think um, I've ever read. And I've gotten to know him through the book um, as a good friend now. That was about five years ago, and now I consider him one of my dearest friends. And so it's a pleasure to introduce him through the book. Introduction. School prepares us to be successful. We aspire to be happy. Robert Landis, Falconer Class of 2001. We are not teaching our children, our students, and our coworkers what they really need to know. The lessons aren't out there on some shelf or website. They won't be found with more money and more programs to push more stuff in more different ways at our kids and our employees. It's not about computer to student ratios, distance learning, high speed links to the Library of Congress, or lecture podcasts. It's not a pricey self help guru claiming that his new thing is new, seven cookbook steps to success, or ten simple mileposts to make a million for your company. Those tools help, but they are the dressing, like ornaments on a Christmas tree. We need to pay attention to the tree itself. Look at the people who invented computers, who designed the internet, who overcame the depression, who envisioned the bestsellers, who challenged racism, who explored the ocean depths, who built the Panama Canal, who created the management consulting firms that, hi that you hired to tell you how to run your business more efficiently. I want my children and my employees and my coworkers and my friends to exhibit qualities like invention, courage, creativity, insight, design, and vision a lot more than I want them to know the capitals of South America or the sequence of presidents and kings, fractions, computer science, art history, running a cash register, or throwing a football. In short, I want us to spend more time teaching how to generate and recognize elegant solutions to the many problems facing our world. Grant, it's great to have you here. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much for, uh, for reading that, Bo. Uh, one of the schools I visited uh, last week uh, down at Porter Gow, the business officer, just used that as an introduction. And I thought it was a lot simpler than me trying to reprise uh, my summary of, of thinking for the last 30 years, because it, uh, it's, it's sort of captured there. Uh, very quickly, just some of the trip summary. I left San Diego on the 9th of September. Uh, since then, I've visited 48 schools, a uh, mixture of uh, independent public schools, K-12, K-6s, 9-12s. Uh, I have about 15 more schools to visit before I get home in uh, uh, the second week of December. I've put about 7,000 miles on the Prius, uh, about another 3,000 miles uh, before I, I get home. I've rotated the tires once, had the oil changed in Philadelphia, and hopefully that will get me home. And when I left, I set the, the, the miles per gallon counter, and I haven't changed it since when I filled up. And I'm flopping back and forth between 48.9 and 49.0 miles per gallon, uh, which is uh, very satisfying. I probably have talked face-to-face -face with about 500, well, I will have by the end of this talk with about 500 educators face-to-face -face, and not just talking at them like, unfortunately, I'm doing here today, though we're going to get into some dialogue, but really be, be having a chance to sit down and, and have deeper discussions. And what a remarkable experience that is, and I'm so honored and privileged to be able to talk to that many great folks over a relatively short period of time. Since I left San Diego, uh, this blows me away. I've had over 22,000 views of my blog. Uh, I'm just a guy in a Prius. So it just shows how interconnected people want to be uh, and learning about what else is going on out there. And uh, I've been in way too many Comfort Inns and Holiday Inn Expresses to even remember. I mean, literally, I almost have to write down on the back of my hand what room number I'm in. So those are just a few of the uh, uh, odds and ends. Uh, at, at, at a somewhat high level, the paradigm that I uh, set out with for this journey, and I think you all have drunk this Kool-Aid, so I'm not going to go into it uh, to, any uh, to any extent, is the world is just changing at an incredible pace. It's, it's irrevocable. It's irreversible. 
Uh, I've got a slide in my slide deck that has an x and a y axis with a steeply rising curve on it. And that's just not a, that's not a fake curve. It, it, it has to do with real things. And we're a knowledge-based industry. And the fact that by 2020, by most estimates, the sum of human knowledge will be doubling every year has to have real impact on us. We are a knowledge-based industry. Um, the, so that's, that's one leg of it. The other one is that uh, not purely due to technology, but because of technology, we have now or are approaching nearly universal access to knowledge. And as far as I can think, uh, since people got around a campfire sometime 20 or 50,000 years ago, the foundation of education has been the relationship between a teacher and a student and knowledge. Teachers purveyor, purveyor of that knowledge to students. And that, because of essentially universal access to knowledge that all, the, all of our students have right here just like we do, uh, that foundation, the, the, that three-legged stool has been disrupted irrevocably. Uh, and, and I think that it validates some of what Bo just read in that kind introduction to my book, things that I and many of us were thinking about. Well, if you ever want to feel really old, tell people what you were thinking about 35 years ago and recognize that half the people in the room were either in elementary school or maybe not born or something. But uh, I think it validates what a lot of us have been saying for a long time, uh, that we just have to approach learning and teaching in a fundamentally different way. It's nothing to do with 21st century. I wish, everybody, we, I wish we could all hold hands, sing kumbaya, and swear to never use that term again. But we know what it means. Uh, and, and so it's useful, at least for some uh, time period. And if we believe this, if we believe that these changes are irrevocable, if we believe that the world, that the, the future is e continuing to evolve at a, a continuously increasing rate, then we as educators have a responsibility, I, I would call it a moral responsibility, to teach in a very different way, to teach our students for their future instead of our past. And I've been with uh, uh, educators during this journey who said exactly that. Uh, on the, on the flip side, I was in Chicago just two days ago at a, at a conference, uh, keynoting a conference for NBOA. And uh, several of the people there said, you know, but we, things are pretty good at our school. You know, admissions demand is strong. We've, we've got money in the bank, that sort of thing. How do we convey that need to change? Or do we really need to change? And, and all I can do is pair it back to those people, what I've heard from these other great educators that I've been able to meet with in the last uh, eight, eight or nine weeks on this trip is, it's not about having to change. It's about knowing it's the right thing to do. Uh, and once you have that obligation as an educator, you either have to have it or not. And I believe that as, as good educators, we have to. Um, when we, I, what I try to always do is, is, is abstract upward. Uh, and one thing about being on a long journey, uh, whether that's a, a time when you have a, long, uh, a lot of time to drive in a car or just any other journey, is you do have time to reflect. And when you have time to reflect, you can abstract upward. Uh, and I think when we boil down all of the seven Ps and five Cs and cookbook methods of 21st century, all that stuff, what it means is, if we, if we look at that within the context of a, a, a world where the future is increasingly unknowable, and it is increasingly unknowable, if you buy into the fact of the rate, rate of change, uh, then the, uh, the inescapable conclusion, I believe, is, is that our obligation is to teach our students to be self-evolving learners. We can't tell them, this is what is, this is, this is, these are the tools for success in the first quintile of the 21st century, therefore that's what you need to know, therefore everything's going to be fine. We don't know that 15 years from now that's what they need to know. We know that's what they need to know now. So what we do know that they need to be able to do is be, be self-evolving learners. And I think if you boil all of the, the pundits and authors and everything I've certainly read and everything I've learned over the last, well, I think 35 years of thinking about this, that's what we want to be doing is teaching our students to become self-evolving learners. And I don't believe that we can do that if we as schools don't become self-evolving organizations. And the fact of the matter is that self-evolving and school have not generally been in the same sentence or mind thought uh, uh, in the past. We as schools, whether we're big public school districts or small startup independents, we generally haven't been all that good at, at, at self-evolving. 
And so that's what I think uh, I'm most interested in is what are schools doing and how are we going to get there to get to that point where we can truly uh, say that we are self-evolving organizations. And now I want to abstract up even one more level, and, and, uh, but you all got to have to promise, first of all, you still come, talk, come to my talk at, at NAIS because some of these things are going to start to leak out and it won't be, the, it won't be all brand new. Brand new. Uh, as I was driving from Connecticut to D.C. on a Sunday, I got somewhere past New York, thank God, uh, through the grace of GPS and was driving down through uh, Maryland and really took that time to try to distill, you know, a lot, sort of synthesize a lot of what I'd been learning. And I got it down to three words. And then I, for whatever reason, I think it was when I kind of mentally held up those three fingers to myself, I remembered the great movie City Slickers with the great philosopher Curly, right? Curly held up one finger and he got it down to two words. You know, they said, what's it all about? He said, it's about one thing. Well, that's two words. I said, I gotta beat Curly. So I gotta get this down to one word. So throw out the extraneous words. It's about Dewey. Dewey's the one word. It's about Dewey or the three words. Uh, everything that we are talking about, and uh, I, I can say this in all honesty, I have not been I've not visited with a single educator on this trip that's talking about what they're doing at their school or what they want to do that John Dewey would not be completely comfortable with. As a matter of fact, I would love it if somebody who's one of these great graphics artist person, people can come up with a, take a picture of Dewey and somehow uh, Photoshop an iPad into his hand. And that's really the, the level of comfort. I have not heard a single Thing, all these wonderful things I've been blogging about, these wonderful, what we call innovation. Uh, uh, John Dewey was telling us all of this 125 years ago. And so I think what we really want to do is just get back to Dewey. And that's not that hard a concept. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to portray myself as a Dewey scholar. Uh, I probably understand 5% of what he was uh, teaching. And it's not just Dewey, of course. It's Montessori and Parker and all the rest of them during that time. Uh, but I think that's a big takeaway, is it's that simple. That's where all these schools that are, are talking about innovation are getting back to. So what's keeping us from doing this? And I, had a, I was in a meeting just last week, we were in a big, ad, had the whole admin team with me, and one of the principals, I think she was principal of the lower school, she just looked at me and she put her head in her hands and she said, why is this so hard? <laughs> and she was really frustrated because they had, she has just a clear view of where she went, why is this so hard? Uh, so here are, some of the, here are some of the obstacles that I think are, are, are coming up as sort of through going and I'm hearing a lot of, uh, at a lot of schools. Uh, and the first is, the most, is, is really one of the most important. I've sort of put a, uh, use, uh, put, put a term on it. I think we, over generations, and we meaning schools and everybody, with school organizations over generations, have built a set of anchors that are holding us back from getting back to where we want to be, back to that, that model of Dewey. And the strongest of those anchors revolves around a dual uh, concept of, of the word ownership. We want educators, we want teachers to own their own learning. We want them to own their professional development. Uh, and that's a great use of the word ownership. On the other hand, a lot of educators, most of us, <laughs> have another concept of ownership. We own our subject, we own time, and we own space. And those are the three defining factors of what education, industrial education, age education uh, is all about, is subject, time, space, and the age of a child. And so when we go to our faculty and say, we need to teach in a different way, we have these big anchors of, no, this is my subject, my time uh, uh, in the day, and my place to teach. And that, th that's one of the really strong things that's, that, that's holding us back. We have to trim those away. We don't take a big ax to it and try to chop it off all at once. We have to trim those away, and then we can get back to where we want to go. 
On the other end of that, first we have an anchor holding us back. On the other end, I think we have a couple of dams. And every school I go to that has an upper school talks about the dam of college admissions. And we, again, if we like 21C is a good whipping post, whipping boy for uh, 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 skills. The APs is a good convenient whipping uh, boy for what we don't want to be teaching. Uh, and yet there's this dam there that they say, but we have to. And they point at the colleges and say it's because of those horrible people that require us to have these on the kids' transcripts so they won't let our kids in. Some of that is myth and some of it is fact, and I'm not going to go into all the detail of my opinion about those or what I've been finding, but so there's an anchor on one end and a dam at the other that keeps us back. Within that, within, within the middle there, of course, we have silos. Uh, I think if we, as educators, if a bunch of us uh, educators were together four years ago and somebody's talked about silos, everybody in the room would have been thinking grain in Iowa. It's amazing how quickly that concept of silos has percolated throughout our industry. Uh, so every school that I go to, we've, the ones that are the, are the most interdisciplinary, the ones who are the most collaborative still are, are struggling with how to get beyond these, these silos that are completely self-imposed. Um, another one is, and, and I, I wish I could uh, uh, give credit to this thought because it was so clearly done, I can't remember who, who said it uh, in the last few weeks sometime. Somebody said, you know, we all, uh, one of the reasons we all work in schools is because we had transformative educational experiences of our own when we were in school. We, there were teachers we loved. They transformed our lives and they did it in a certain way. And lacking anything else, we're, we as a teacher are going to come in and we want to reprise that experience for our students. We want to be transformative. And so what do we do? We do things the same way that, that that experience occurred to us. And unfortunately, that world doesn't exist any longer. And so it's the wrong thing to do. And so there's this, there's this ego about being that transformative experience. And ego, I'm not trying to be pejorative there. Uh, ego is a real thing. Uh, and, and, and that's, but it's another cause of why we, why we uh, resist, going, uh, resist going to where we want to go. There are myths uh, that we just have to bust. The myth that if you don't teach students math for a certain number of periods a day, they're gonna, in a certain number of days a week, they're going to forget their math. Or if they don't have, aren't exposed to their foreign language uh, for more than, you know, if they have a gap in two weeks, suddenly they're not going to be able to speak Spanish any longer. Uh, the myth of bloom. Uh, I had a fourth, is either a fourth or fifth grade student at the Sabbath at Stony Point School outside Richmond sit where y'all are sitting today and unprompted he told me why Bloom's taxonomy was incorrect. And he used the words, Bloom's taxonomy is not right because. And he went on to explain that it's not a pyramid, that when they were asked to think about it, he first drew it as a circle, then realized that wasn't right and drew it as a spiral. And I said to him, how do you even know that? He says, well, they've been talking to us about this since we were in kindergarten. Because those teachers in that school, they talk to students about how they learn. And they're giving them the tools to the kingdom rather than expecting that somehow you're going to get this uh, osmotically as you, as you grow up. Um, and one other that I'll share with you, and I've only shared this uh, with, uh, with, with once in, in public, and I'm not going to go into all the detail because it's a little bit turgid, but uh, for years I have thought, uh, based on my experience, my 30,000 hours of working in independent school and working with a lot of other schools, that uh, change is actually improbable at our schools. Uh, and the reason at an independent school it's improbable is because we go through cycles, and these cycles have to be coordinated rather nicely in order for us to ever engage in substantial change. For example, you have leadership cycles. We have a head come in. We all know, it's not a secret, heads don't, are not going to institute significant structural change in a school in the first or last year of their tenure. This is not going to ever happen. We have accreditation cycles. And we all know that we as a school are not going to it institutes significant structural change as we're writing our accreditation reviews. And we have strategic planning cycles. And then we have principals who come and go. And we have leadership, uh, we have board leadership cycles where boards are stronger and weaker. And I actually have thought for a long time that creates a sense where there's, there are actually narrow windows where we can engage in real structural change. And now we've worked the math, I say we. My son worked out the math for me on this because I'm not very good at math. 
uh, and I gave him some very, very middle of the road inputs. And I asked him, how much time is available over a 20 or 30 pe year period that, on a random basis where we could really institute structural change that might take a year or two to, 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 get, to gain root? And under really vanilla circumstances, that number is 24%. And it doesn't, you don't have to tweak things very much for that number to get into the low teens. And it's almost impossible to get that number over 50% of time that's actually available to a school to institute structural change. And we're going to work out the algorithm on this and we're going to make a little tool that you can use, input the actual uh, circumstances for your school and see how by adjusting some of these cycles, you can increase the opportunities of available time when you actually can engage in structural change. And here, now, here's one, uh, I, I, I talked about this uh, at this conference in Chicago and uh, that was kind of a closed session, so this is the first time. What I'm going to say now is, is a bit provocative and I hope to some of you it doesn't come off as being over the top, but what the heck, uh, y'all aren't paying me for this talk so I can say what I want. <laughs> um, change is hard, right? Every book I've read about change, every author I've read about change, change is hard. And if you've been at a school, most of us believe, and I've been saying this for the whole trip. Every one of the schools I visit talk about, but it's really hard, it's, it's hard. I was driving from, on the road from Charlottesville to, to Greenville, sorry, Charleston to Greenville. And I had a bit of an, an epiphany, and I really think this is important. I think ridding Europe of the Nazis was hard. And I think going to the moon was hard. I think homesteading on the plains of Kansas in the eight, 19th century was hard. I think having, giving birth to a child after 20 hours of labor and raising that child as a single mom is hard. I think running a 440 in the Olympics on carbon fiber legs is hard. I think eating dust at a forward operating base for a year in the Karangal Valley of eastern Afghanistan is hard. And I think hugging your kid who's going to spend a year at a forward operating base in the Karangal Valley is hard. I think we need to get some perspective about this. I think changing schools is very uncomfortable. And I think we really need to understand the difference between discomfort and what's really hard. We're Americans. We do hard things. I think changing a school is prickly, messy, chaotic, <laughs> turbid, and ultimately very uncomfortable for some people. I think we have had a myth. There is a myth that it's hard. And to some extent, that myth is perpetrated by people who make a lot of money telling you you need to pay me a lot of money to come in and change your school because it's hard. Uh, so that's a perspective change that I think we need to get over and not be continuously reinforcing to ourselves and our faculty and our administrators, this is really hard and we have to grieve about it. I get all that stuff. But I think we need to put it into perspective. The good news is, <laughs> The good news is that this journey I've been on, I've been visiting schools that are doing it all and doing it in massive ways. They're doing it with incredible passion and commitment and enthusiasm and results. Uh, they're doing it not all following the same model. They're working the problem themselves. Some, are, some have never left Dewey, the re, small Reggio schools that have never left Dewey. Some are doing it by being expeditionary and going out beyond their classes and spending 30% of their time off campus. Uh, everybody's doing it in their own way. And the fact is that every one of these obstacles that we talk about are already being solved, not schools of the future. This is schools of today. This is happening right now. And it's not a public and private thing. If I had this journey to do over again, I would have visited more public schools. Because there are public schools with a fraction of the resources that independent schools have who are doing the most extraordinary work and showing the way for us. 
It's not a question of money. There are schools, both independent and public schools, that have vastly less resources than we, that are operating out of miserable facilities. Those of you who've been at the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia, it's a horrible building. It's, it's three floors in a horrible building. Uh, and their kids are getting into college everywhere that ki kids are from any of the best schools in, in, in the country. And so I don't think it's a, it's a question of, it's not about buying a particular model or fitting into a particular slot. It's about understanding what these other schools are doing, how they're doing it, and just getting down the path. And so I just wanted to share uh, a few sort of random reflections. These are not linear. Uh, uh, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up and, and y'all may wanna ask some uh, questions. Uh, since just sort of general reflections from the road. Uh, again, I just mentioned the sort of remarkable enthusiasm and passion that I've encountered at so many of these schools. Uh, and where the faculty are together. Uh, I mentioned Science Leadership Academy. Uh, when, when I left Science Leadership Academy, having talked with Chris Lehman and a couple of his uh, administrators and faculties about how those faculty, how those teachers think about each other, the, o the only corollary I had in my mind, the only analog I had in my mind for that was soldiers. Who'd gone, these, these people weren't just friends. They were comrades <laughs> on a mission to march up this hill uh, uh, and, and not let anything stop them. It's extraordinary. Uh, connectivity. So many, so I, I've, I've gotten more connected uh, in the world because Bo and Jill said, Grant, get over yourself. Start going on Twitter. Uh, you know, it's not about reducing your grand thoughts of life to 140 characters. It's about being connected with people. And there are folks here today, uh, Shelley and Megan and others, that I never even met face to face, but I've met them by being connected. And we have principals who are insisting that their faculty get connected to the world and, and enhance their professional development. And the faculty are doing this with the students. And I was at one school, I think it was Poughkeepsie Day School in New York, where back to school night, the seventh grade teacher had all the parents in there and said, okay, get out your phones. You are going to start a Twitter account because your kids have one now and you need to know what this is about. Uh, and so that, what, that connectivity that's happening is, is, is extraordinary. Uh, the process takes place over different time periods. Colorado Academy uh, has decided they're going all in with design thinking. And in two or three, four years, boom, this thing is, this pot's rolling right along very quickly. They're throwing out courses. They're instituting new courses. The faculty are all getting trained. It's happening very quickly. And then I sit down with Bill Christ at Hathaway Brown. And Bill says, well, it was 15 years ago that we decided we were going to do such and such. And I said, Bill, you kind of set up a skunk works back then, didn't you? And he goes, yeah, you know, and I guess you put it that way, we did. And now we all know what's out at Hathaway Brown. It's an extraordinary program. It just doesn't even look like a school in so many ways. It doesn't matter. Uh, very different time scales are, are, are available to us. Uh, we know that some of this comes from interdisciplinary collaboration, the breaking down of those silos and teachers working together. But I heard a wonderful term used uh, just uh, a few days ago. It, it, this has almost become non-disciplinary. It's not interdisciplinary, it's non-disciplinary. I had a student at this small, uh, the smallest school I visited, Meridian Academy in Boston, 46 students, uh, grades six through 12. And one of the students said, that what's great about this school is, I don't have to shift from math brain to history brain to science brain. The brain is turned on all the time. It's not, it's not interdisciplinary. It's non-disciplinary. And gee, that's how the kids learn the best. We're reallocating time. The number one, I've, I talked to you about those anchors. The number one expression of that at every school, what's the biggest problem you have? Time. We're not allocating time. We're not allocating time to professional development. We're not allocating time to align with our mission. And then you look at what people like the Hawkins School have done, which completely blow up their schedule and align, finally say, this is where we want to get to. This is our, these are our resources. Let's put those things in alignment. And it's just ex the, the innovation and creativity there and, and the student learning has just exploded. I'm talking to so many schools now that are focusing on value. When they, when they say, when they start talking to me, they in their minds don't necessarily have, oh, I'm focusing on value. But as they're talking, that's what they're expressing. 
that they're expressing that they, that they as an organization are focusing on what is the differentiating value that, uh, that we're developing here and can articulate as an entire organization. And that we're using that as a foundational planning and organizational tool. Uh, and, 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 and every school I go to, I say, okay, now I'm talking to the admin team. Thank you very much. You all are on the same page because you wrote the strategic plan or wrote the vision statement or whatever. Now if I walk down the halls and I ask every teacher, will I hear the same thing? And I'm getting a lot of great honest responses. Some folks saying, well, you know what, you know, probably not. And other folks saying, by God, you will. And okay, let's go from there to there, where everybody can understand the value, because of course our teachers, our parents are our best ambassadors. Uh, I'm seeing, somebody asked me what was your biggest surprise and I, on the journey, and I said, well, other than all those lights on the dashboard of my Prius coming on at once, uh, in, 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 as I was driving across the Kansas Plains in a rainstorm, which was not a good surprise, the, the great surprise is walking into some of these classrooms at all grade levels and just seeing teachers who've utterly let go. They've just let go. And they'll tell me, my students are teaching each other, my students are learning better. At the end of the day, I walk up to my students and ask them what did they learn, uh, not hand them a quiz to find out what they learned. Uh, they've, 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 they're cutting that bond of ego that requires them to be the center of the class. Uh, and it's just a beautiful thing to see because the, the explosion of the kids owning their own learning just fills that vacuum, just like any vacuum is filled in nature. And then the last, uh, last thing I want to mention in these sort of reflections is uh, this idea of, of, of frequency and amplitude. Uh, I think at schools we, f we focus too much we spend too much of our energy, we, we design events, and we do, whether it's professional development or anything else around big high amplitude, low frequency events. Every year at the beginning, right before the beginning of school, let's get together and have professional development days. Go to a conference for two days. Uh, or the other side of it, which is really sort of absurd, is let's get together at a retreat and be quiet and reflect for a day. Uh, and what happens after that? So that's big high amplitude, right? And then afterwards, it just tails off like this because we all have to go back and our day jobs interfere. Uh, that's high amplitude, low frequency, once a quarter, twice a year, once a year, assessment of faculty every two years, that sort of thing. We need to flip those around. We need to flip around both our innovation strategies and our times for reflection and respection of tra respecting tradition and quiet into low amplitude, high frequency events. It's not that big a deal every one time, but we're doing it a lot. <laughs> and we're doing it re repeatedly and frequently and sustainably. And I think if we do that, if we change the amplitude and frequency of our innovation practices, what we're thinking about in terms of changing the school, we uh, we're going to get a we're going to get a long way down the road. Uh, three cheap game changers, and I, I'm being Johnny Appleseed about these. And I just won't go anywhere without saying them now. I know some of you have already done this. Uh, why is every vertical surface in our in our classrooms now not covered with idea paint? I know I'm going to see some that love it, and I already saw some over here at Trinity. Uh, I was sitting in a classroom, especially with little kids, teachers up at the front asking the questions, writing the answers, all the kids are raising their hands, and in a classroom of 15 or 18 or 19 students, over a 20-minute period, each kid's going to get called on once. If they had a dry erase marker in their hand, an idea of paint on the wall, every single one of them is going to be writing every one of those uh, answers down all the time, and every student I've, taught, I've, I've thrown this idea out to just goes, wow, that would be so cool. I, we wouldn't have to be sitting down all the time. <laughs> low technology, low cost. We don't have to have maps. and I love maps. I'm a map king of all time. We don't have to have maps and posters on the walls all the time because we've got them all on our iPads and our computers and in our databases. So that's number one, idea paint. Rolling desks, these marvelous desks that have casters on the bottom and a little basket underneath there for your books. And I've, I've been in class now, eighth grade math class, a senior English class, elementary school class. The teacher goes, great, let's reform. Boom. All of a sudden, the groups are reformed. 
boom, they do it again. And just that act of reforming all the, constantly, what a, what a completely changed dynamic. Uh, and then finally, uh, why, especially at lower schools and even at middle schools, do we have more than three blocks of time and we cause all these problems with ourselves with scheduling and everything? We had a STEM block, a humanities block, and an arts block, and we told these teachers, collaborate on your two hours, collaborate on your two hours, collaborate on your two hours, and all this scheduling problem that we go through all the time would go right out the window. So, those are my three cheap ideas. None of those cost more than a little, a penny. None of the three of those cost much. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the hard part of this, which is, or the discomfort, the uncomfortable part of this, which is how we get there, because I really want to synthesize that a lot more uh, after this, uh, after my journey is over, or this, this leg of my journey, this, uh, this trip is over, uh, and that's really a subject for another time. I, I am seeing some very uh, through-going uh, 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 trends, uh, with schools that, that, that feel like they're really getting down the road. They're really changing. They're, they're, they're very different schools than they were even five years ago. I'll be pulling those together. I'm going to kind of shut up uh, for now, and, and hopefully there's one or two questions either here with our folks uh, who've been uh, watching in from afar, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. Hi, I'm Grant Lichtman here at the SAIS Lunch and Learn. Uh, thanks for all coming.